Hello, and welcome to another episode of Agility on the Ear. Today, we have the great opportunity to hear the agility life story of an international agility star from Sweden, as today's episode will be in English. She first came in touch with agility when she was in her late teens and trained and competed with their family dog. For sure, not the easiest dog to train, but at least she learned to be persistent and to always be very inventive about new ideas for the training. This dog taught her that no challenge is too big and that there's always another way. After a many years long break from agility and dog sport life, when she was working day and night as a news photographer, she rediscovered the sport a little by accident and got hooked immediately. So she restarted her career in 2012 with her Jack Russell Terrier. And soon after that, Border Collie Storma came into her life. And with her, her life changed completely. From being a beginner, she took her to adventures she could only dream of. Podiums, national team, EO, AWC, and traveling all over Europe. Thanks to her and agility, she made so many friends and got to the run the coolest competitions. They ended their career with winning the team final at Gold Rush, since she unfortunately had to retire shortly after that. Sometimes she thinks about herself, she should more be interested about results, but she appreciates the joy of a cool run so much more where she can feel nothing but the flow especially after COVID, when competitions was closed for almost a year, she feels more than ever that she just wants to enjoy every second of her life with her dogs at its fullest. <clears throat> that the dogs' lives and careers are so short and she wants to give them and herself the possibility to have as much fun as possible. She loves that this is a sport where you all the time have so much to learn and that you need to develop in so many ways. As a dog trainer, as an athlete, and with your mental skills. She truly thinks it's an amazing and complex sport that combines physics, the relation to an animal, dog training, memory skills, and highest focus in a very short time performance. People sometimes tell her that she has a great attitude and energy even if she or her dogs made some mistakes. But she told me before, it is maybe not her attitude. It is more about her lifestyle motto, You never know which run will be the last together. That is the reason why she is truly grateful and happy for the possibility to do this. I'm looking forward to hear more about this impressive person. Hello to our Swedish agility woman, Annika F. Klerke. Hi, and thank you for having me. It's uh, such an honor to be here. And especially it's very fun since I'm a frequent listener of this podcast. Uh, it's a... It's so always a great way for me to practice my German skills. <laughs> <laughs> Glad you were able to set it up today. Thanks. So, you. tell us how you got into agility. Well, I started agility when I was a late teenager, and I started with our family dog, and he was a Eurasian, and not the easiest type of dog that you can have. It's a big Spitz, and he had a lot of own ideas. So what he wanted to do and uh, uh, what, what he had kind of, what, what kind of interests he had. But I think I might not have appreciated it by that time because I guess I was sometimes a bit frustrated about our struggles. But I think at that I, in a kind of an early age, age, learned what the key of dog training is. Um, that is as simple as that, that it's, it's about creating behaviors. It's about rewarding behaviors, creating emotions, and um, that we need to have a great imagination about how we do that. And, um, and in an early age, I learned to know what, what is a reward and how do we develop rewards for a dog. Can you tell us more about this topic, especially like rewarding a dog? What means it for you and how you can reward in your mind what is like right or maybe what's not the best way? Yeah, because I truly think that uh, what's a reward? That's something that the dog decides. Um, I sometimes have students who, for example, they... They have a dog and they want to reward it with a dog toy. And um, 
that specific dog isn't really interesting that at all. Um, and it, well, what we must know is that a reward is something that makes the dog wants to repeat that behavior. And so even if we, we have an idea of, yeah, we want to tug and play to create more drive and so on, it's not a reward if the dog doesn't appreciate it. And it's up to our own imagination how we can make uh, this specific reward uh, fit for that dog. And um, I think we can see it also in two ways, that we actually can develop our dog's ability to like different kind of rewards. There's a lot of amazing games and exercises to develop both the dog's interest in playing, chasing, and also for food. Um, so we should always put a, a big, big focus on, on that. But I also think that we should sometimes accept what the dog thinks is really, really fun. And I mean, the dogs, will, will, for example, with, from those breeds that isn't that interested in tugging or chasing, maybe they like food better, we can always find a great way to present food in a drive and speedy and playful way. Um, so, um, for example, my Eurasia, I, I taught him to retrieve balls for treats. And uh, also when it comes to the opposite, I had a dog that suffered from a liver disease and she only could eat her extremely specific diet food. And I taught her to exchange uh, taking a treat with playing. So then it was the opposite way that we can really, really, um, we, can, we can really work with it. And I think it's up to us as a dog trainer to do that work. Wow. I'm impressed already after a few minutes. <laughs> I liked it really much. So I don't see it or hear it very often what you now about rewarding a dog why do you think this happens that the people are not doing it in this way because of humans that we are not looking what our dogs like or because we don't have the knowledge what's the reason for it i sometimes think it's just traditions and some of the lack of knowledge and sometimes that we are so much focusing focusing on just thinking of the sport we're training. I don't know, agility, for example, instead of going back to the basic, what is dog training? And um, I think that uh, your dog is a mirror of your own training and education. And um, that there is no, th I mean, everything your dog knows, it's, it's about you. Everything your dog for example, fails in training or trials, it's because of you. It's because of your education. And um, I think we need to be so honest that we can always see that, yeah, there is no such thing as the dog should know by now. For, I hear that sometimes. Oh, but he, she, he or she should know that by now. But yeah, but then we haven't maybe trained that enough or we haven't maintained that skills enough. It's easy as that. Oh, yeah. So do you think that mistakes happen because we don't teach it in a right way or we make the mistake and say to the dog like with reward in a wrong second, this is right, but it was too late the reward? I mean, I, I think it's always the, the, the fault from, from the trainer. The do I think our dogs are always trying the best. I, I mean, uh, and... There is no dog in the world that are planning to do, oh, today I'm going to dump the contact. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I, think I, I think it's very good to be very honest of what the do your dog knows and to, to know what your dog knows. For example, it was a situation last weekend where it was a dog walk situation and I knew on forehand that my dog don't know that yet. And I was already planning on the on the, the course walk that I won't redo the dog walk if she misses because I know that she can't. This is something we, we will fix at home. And so I think we should be really, really honest 
about what our dog know. And, and we can't just wish for good luck <laughs> at that competition. And I think we sometimes do that a little bit too often. That we hope and wish that something suddenly will work out. Like you talking about this all, what means agility for you? Because I have the feeling it's not only like a sport for you, it's much more. I'm right. <clears throat> In one way, I could say that it means everything. I mean, it's the most fun thing to do. Uh, but on the other hand, it's also just a silly dog sport. And I guess my, me and my dogs would be as happy doing something else. Uh, but the thing with agility is that it's so much about playing. It's us chasing, chasing each other. It's the ultimate trust. It's the ultimate connection with an animal. And I think that's the thing that we all love so much with agility. There's so few things that beats the rush of agility. True. Yeah. So take us there more into what means for you like the ultimate connection or the ultimate trust. I mean, the dogs are basically running in blind in agility. They're running in full speed and they need to trust us so much that they, can, that they will get information in time where to go. And I mean, wow, what a, what a trust. I wouldn't run my fastest. <laughs> so they really trust us so much. And, and um, I think what also can really easily happen in an agility run is you experience this flow. And um, it's, I guess it's the ultimate state of mind when doing a sport. It's like when time's standing still and nothing else exists. And you don't know what's happening around. It's just you, your connection. It's you and your dog. And it's a uh, total connection and trust. Mm. I like this view of agility or this sport. And I told also before in the presentation of you that you like this flow much more than results. Why? Is there a reason for it? Yeah, I'm, I think it's, it's, a, it's a two parts. I mean, in, in one part, I'm super competitive. I really am. God, I want every detail and every, every little thing to be perfect as it can be. Uh, but just what says on the results board, that's not so interesting, I sometimes think, because I can sometimes win, but I'm not so satisfied anyway. And I can have the coolest run with just a little silly mistake in the end. But, and that can be the one that I would remember for years. And um, yeah, I think I'm really fascinated by the thought of the perfect run. Uh, where you just, where you just, um, yeah, get, where you get every piece so perfect. I think that's um, a part of why I've been traveling so much the last six months. And I guess a lot of German listeners might wonder who this crazy Swede is, who is always in Germany every month. And in one way, I think it's some kind of early middle age crisis <laughs> uh, that other people might buy a motorcycle or getting fillers in the face. And I'm traveling to Germany instead competing. <laughs> Uh, but especially after those two last very strange years in the world, I have had this feeling of that life is so short. And if it's on my bucket list to run on, on, in bigger rings, uh, courses made by extremely talented judges, if that's on my bucket list, then it's quite easy to fulfill. I mean, it's harder to, I don't know, climb Mount Everest or something like that. So um, when borders opened it up a little bit, I just thought that, oh, I want to, you know, you never know what run is your last. And I want every run to count. And I want to be challenged. I want to have hard courses. And even if I sometimes fail and we get disqualified or anything, it's so cool to see, oh my God, if we just had made that, then we had made it. And 
I was in Germany some weeks ago and had one win and like a lot of disqualifications. But still on my way home, I was just so happy and so inspired. And I immediately got to work and I made myself exercises and training and plan how to train to, uh, uh, to be able to, um, yeah, you know, to be able to have the skills for everything that we failed the last weekend. So, yeah, I think that's, uh, th that's the, the really big drive for me. So you take the most of your disqualifications or let's name it like mistakes out of your runs that you say, okay, I have to train this more or I have to prepare my dog for this situation better. Yes, absolutely. And I also have a privilege now that I have two dogs in training. And I also compete them now in the same grade. Uh, and that's really, really funny because I can always, you know, compare them to each other and compare times. And I, you know, I always do split screens of trainings and competitions and being really geeky about it and it's so fun to you know to come to, to see where we gain time where we lose time and um, yeah sometimes i even think it's more interesting when i have a course or a run with with some failures so i can you know really analyze where something happened um <laughs> sometimes i think I, maybe i should be more interested in winning <laughs> than, than than you know being so geeky about it but yeah I think, I think that's the, the way that I think is so fun about this sport. Were there also times in agility when you were frustrated or unhappy? Yeah, I, I'm, I always get, of course, very unhappy when people are unfair to the dogs. A little bit, that's what we talked about earlier, and that I hate the expression, he or she should know that. Um, I hate that when we don't realize, as I said, that the dog's performance is a mirror of, of all training. And um, sometimes people tell me that, oh, you are always so happy and you're so, you're sharing your dog so much. And I think that I really, really appreciate, really, truly appreciate my dogs so much. Um, it's I think some of it comes back from a big trauma that happened to me 2016 when I lost a dog during a tryout. Um, she wasn't competing, but she was there as her mascot and she had epilepsy. And during that weekend, her epilepsy escalated. And during one night in the middle of the, the weekend, I had to, we had to, um, just leave the tryout and go to go to a veterinary station and she really couldn't make, make it. And um, I went back to the competition the day after because I was so far away from home anyway and it was just better for me to be around friends and, you know, just to do something. And I guess I was also in a bit of a shock, of course. And it was... Of course, a very, very strange situation for me to be there. And it was the last runs of the day. And people and seeing people being sad or irritating over their agility runs. Um, and I was standing there and had just lost a dog. And I had that really, really strong feeling by then that I never want to be there and I never want to get in those situations. I never want agility to count so much. I, I always want to be truly grateful for the time I have together with my dogs. Is this why your lifestyle motto is you never know which one will be the last together and that you enjoy the time with your dogs at fullest? Yes, I think so. And also that I, I had to retire uh, my oldest dog, Storma, quite early. Um, and even though I had had two extra years with her, because um, two years earlier she um, um, she had got a diagnosis that he had bad arthritis in one toe, and it was that it was so damaged that the specialist veterinary said that she would probably never be able to do any kind of explosive activities again. 
And um, after that, and after a long rehab, I really ran her like, yeah, I didn't know how long her toe could, could make it. So we really, really run every run at like if it was our very, very last. And we were never better than after that. And I think that's also, I mean, I'm not interested in competing just for competing. I never go to a comp competition just to compete. I always want to, I don't know, have, have hard courses or learn something from it or develop or experience anything. Um, I want every run to count. So let's go back a little bit to Stormer's story. So she was, she had this diagnosis and you run agility with her just go on or you changed on something or we're searching for some other possibilities you can do with her no well it was like that we had been uh, we had been on the team and uh, the awc team um, 2017 and we had a great year and in january the year after uh, she started getting problems with the toe and when she didn't get better we um, Uh, we um, oh, well, we eventually came to a specialist who said that yeah, this this uh, toe is so injured and uh, she probably probably never will be able to do anything explosive and and so on again and uh, that her career will, will would be ended. And I was of course extremely devastated and um, but at the same time, as I said, uh, I was also happy that she was. A healthy dog and that we hadn't got I don't know a deadly disease or, or so on so I after the, a long rehab we did that spring I um, decided since she was really really fit and uh, couldn't see anything with the toe I decided to run a last competition with her as a farewell tour um, so I decided that we should go to the, um, the national team tryout Uh, just to be able to run amazing courses. That's last, like the last thing we did. And um, so, she, so we went to the tryout without, without like any any preparations. She, she was a, of course very fit. We had done extremely good rehab and strength and training, but we hadn't any agility training. And I was also, what also happened that weekend, it was like, I was so super sick. I was coughing blood <laughs> all the time. So it, I mean, in that condition, we think of how it looks like these days. No one would let me in, in that hall yeah. <laughs> at all. I was so sick. And we ran the first run and I was like expecting that that would be the last. It was a very strange feeling. Like when my friends were cheering me, I'm like, yeah, you don't know. <laughs> And um, and after that run, we were like, okay, but she's looking really fine after the cool down. And I decided to run another run, and it 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 kept going. I and in the end, we ran the whole tryout, and she was completely fine after it. And um, I think. After that, we, I, as I said, I kept running her like if every run was over very lost because I couldn't know. And I think also that when there's been this discussion about hard courses in social media, I sometimes hear that people think you need to train day and night to have a lot of skills in the dogs. And with Storma, I could really show that you don't really don't need it because I was really experimenting with how little can I train her to keep her on the highest level and, and still um, train as little, what you say, pure agility as possible. So I had a, the most focus was on keeping her fit and, and strong and just train as little as we could just to, don't expose her to for too much training and so that's really cool yeah. and then you run also gold rush with her and after her this you retire her yeah um that you that years after uh, when after this happened 
we, um, we actually first we uh, we became uh, white Swedish champions, and it was like that was probably the biggest victory of all time, especially what happened then, because you know um, I entered the ring and. I, I, you know, you hear the, the crowd cheering and, it, and you're like, oh my God, they don't know. They don't know that I've already won just by standing here at the starting line. So it was really amazing that after those, this, this really hard year that we could stand there as wise Swedish champions. And, um, and yeah, about gold rush, yeah. And I also think that team medals all, always means a lot. And um, that first year we actually made it, we made it to the podium with, with teams um, already 2018. And 2019, we actually won the, the, the team competition with our, with our team. So it was so funny and such a cool experience. And as I said, it's so fun to run teams. Uh, that's nothing that beats that feeling of, you know, doing this together with friends. And yeah, that was Storma's last big competition because um, she retired after uh, COVID came and uh, then we found out that she had spondylosis. So she's now happy retired and um, she is really fit, I would say, and active and having a really active life. So um, I think she's really living the life of, of the queen she is. Now you just walk her and make some tricks with her or you find anything else? Um, I, I actually try to do quite a lot of things because she's just nine and a half and she has no thought of being a, you know, an, an old lady. Uh, I bring her, of course, to every training and she's always allowed to do something little uh, so that she, that she, I think it's really important that your Thai dogs feel that they are an active part of everything. And uh, she always trained a little thing. And um, we also tried to do a lot of other things like tracking and searching for items like article search. And in the summer times, we also do herding. And um, she's actually a great herding dog. So, yeah, I think she, she, she don't miss I did the training at all. She's... Uh, extremely happy with just being the queen of the back yeah let's ask you a question about when you say like yeah she's not missing agility but it was a big part of her life how do you or how would you say that this is a human problem that we are thinking agility is everything for my dog or is it just some attitude from ourselves. I think you are pinpointing something really important. I quite often hear that people say that, uh, oh, my dog misses agility so much and he's old and I have to run him or anything. But I think it's actually, it's our job to create, I mean, fun, fun stuff in a dog's life. And um, I mean, Agility is a privilege. Agility is something that we should be very, very lucky if we have dogs that, that have bodies that can tolerate the extreme pressure of agility. So um, I really see it as a privilege and that we always need to have a backup plan uh, to do something else. And that, um, yeah. And I mean, <clears throat> for me, if it comes to, if you, if you see it as my, how my training looks like for my dogs, so I think of it as agility consists of two parts. It's the agility, that's the skill training, and it's the handling part. But agility is also the fitness training. And I see it as a big part as agility training. So um, I plan my weeks that we, that, uh, that's, that, those two parts really combine each other and also that we also need to plan for the, the for the recovery and that's extremely big, big part of it i mean you can't gain results if you don't recover that's um the basic in basic in when it comes to physical training trainings 
I'm also an educated personal trainer myself and educated in uh, team sports training. And I think it's very fun to try to implement my thoughts when it comes to, um, you know, human fitness training to the dogs. Uh, so we have the agility training, the fitness training, and of course, the great food that the dog should have the best nutrition you can possibly give them to, you know, to gain results. And also that part of recovery. When it comes to recovery, for example, I think it's one thing I've learned during the years is that, for example, traveling days are not resting days. We often think that, okay, we're traveling home a whole day from a, from, from a competition far away and the dog is recovered when we come home because he's been sleeping in the car all, all the time. But I would say that traveling is exhausting for them so that we need to, you know, have, have that in our, our plan. And I also think it's very important to, to plan before we train. It's very easy that we analyze the training after the training and we maybe we write a tra training diary afterwards. But I, I think I'm mostly successful when I plan before the training. Uh, that I want to know what I'm training and why. And if that happens, what do I do then? If that happens, what do I do then? How do I, how will I, for example, tomorrow adjust my training if that or that happens? So I have a training plan and I, I can, you know, adjust myself quickly as their trainer, teacher. And um, yeah, because they, because that's what um, develops us. Really, th really think. Can you give us an example when you say like, yeah, recovery is important. I absolutely agree. But how you do plan the recovery of your dogs for a training or after competitions? Or can you give us there an example? I mean, it doesn't have to be so complicated. It's about, um, for example, if you're competing every weekend, uh, in, in a time, then it's really, really hard to have a lot of trainings in the week. And you need, you need to, maybe I sometimes also skip a competition weekend because, because I need to, you know, have days off. Um, and also since I have some days that are just fitness training, um, I can't train what you say, high quality agility the day after, because when I train high quality agility, I want my dogs to be extremely recovered, extremely fast extremely, you know, energized. So we need to plan that. Uh, and also, you know, uh, see how my week looks like. How is the weather? Uh, for, for, for example, now in Sweden, it's ice everywhere. So you really have to plan, where can I go? Where can I, can I give my dog a great exercise? And, and so on. And um, yeah, I, I think it's really important to think of this, that Agility is a really, really high pressure sport for the dog's body and also for, I mean, for all bodies. I mean, I really, I'm sometimes really surprised that people don't have more injuries during agility than we have. Because it's a lot of stops and turns and, and you know, breaking directions. And uh, yeah, uh, when I'm talking about that, it, It always comes to back to my one of my <laughs> all-time favorite subjects, and it's warm-up. Um, I think we should always talk more about warm-up. And so let's uh, talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think it's. I mean, when it comes to you know, when it, from human sports, how big big role warm-up plays to to be a great athlete and to actually. Um, increase the performance i mean warm-up it's not not just something we do to avoid injuries warm-up warm -up is actually something we do to have a better performance um i mean we often often go for a short walk on leash for the dogs and maybe sometimes not even that and that's not a warm-up and for example if you look to the human side does No, I mean, no track and field athlete who is about to run 400 meters hurdle would just go for a walk. And I mean, a soccer player, he wouldn't, he wouldn't even go for a walk. We need to create, um, uh, what would you say, incre create and increase the blood flow. And we need to raise body temperature because that makes um, 
the dog fast and we need to activate the elasticity and um, and, and also <laughs> for ourselves and i mean elasticity and um, and that that's really that's something that you can help the dog to jump better and be faster and we need to activate the, those it's called like fast twitches in the body with springs and it's like you turn on the switches uh, it's a push you push the buttons that make the dog fast and ready so yeah and um also, sometimes I hear handlers saying, or you know, students, students saying, "Oh, I, but I don't can't warm up so much because I get so tired." I'm like, "No, you don't get tired. You get faster." Because <laughs> it's really, really true. You actually can make yourself faster with a proper warm up with exercises that, um, that yeah, activates elasticity and you know, creates speed in your body. Why do you think that this topic is not so popular still? It's not so much in the mind. Well, a lot of people heard about it, but not a lot of people do it. Well, it goes both ways. I think actually some people, a lot of people now really think about it. I think it's it has really changed the last years that we, we talk more about this subject. But also... I think it's also maybe a bit of tradition um, that people maybe sometimes want that agility should be for everyone. It shouldn't be an, like a sport. It should be something that everyone can perform. Um, but if, I think it's really important that we think it, even if we as a, as a handler or self don't want to be, what do you say, sporty, <laughs> we must accept that it's a sport for our dogs yes. so at least we need to um, have that part really on top of mind yes. and that we need to educate ourselves nice yes so you are like a professional dog trainer it's like your area of life yeah i teach agility yes so and how do you, how do your trainings look like with your yeah. dogs Uh, with my dogs, um, yeah, well, as I said, I have th those um, two parts, that it's both agility and the fitness, and I always try to have a plan for what I'm tra training, and it's either skills or it's handling, and the skill is skills for my dogs now that are competing in grade three, it's a lot about maintaining skills and, um, you know, always develop Uh, th things that I see that can be always be better and oh God, I love teaching those uh, skills and that's the best with the summertime here in Sweden when I have my own feel and I can just go out for five minutes and train something little it's so it's so fun and then we also have the part of handling and I always um, try to build up what my dogs really need right now it can sometimes it's um, you know a handling skill that we, are, we will be failing in the last competition and sometimes i build up what i think they need for example when they need to just feel that agility is easy then i build up something like that uh, where, where they can just go and you know increase the speed and um yeah and so on and then so also I try, I try to train them the fitness and for that we have both the strength training and also i try to think a lot of their jumping training and um you know jumping technique and jumping strength and for example especially with the, one of my dogs my five-year-old vita i put a lot of time in teaching her to jump better because she's had a, a lot of struggles with jumping and um it's really really cool that we have come so far and um you know I'm really, really, I'm really, really happy to see that she's really fighting for and really wants to uh, do her best and that I have given her, what do you say, abilities to be better and perform the way she wants to herself. So let's talk a little bit about jump training, how you do this and when you decide a dog needed or it's not needed at all. Um, I think it's really hard and I'm really, really not an expert. Um, 
we both have those classical jumping techniques training that we uh, that we do. Uh, but I also think that we need to sometimes see what kind of jumping problems do this specific dog have. Um, is it takeoff? Is it um, is it lack of self confidence? Because I one problem that I realized also with the, um, my dog was that. You know, if you expect yourself to fail, then you don't try as hard. Are you with me? Yeah. Um, so I've been thinking really a lot of that part. And um, for example, I stopped correcting her jumping because I, re I realized that she already know. She, I mean, she already know it was a mistake. Uh, so... Instead of that, I try to, you know, increase self-confidence and that, um, yeah. And that also I uh, try to be even more hard on my own, what do you say, my own part of it, that we, that we jump together. A jump is both or a responsibility. And um, I know that some People think that we sh the dog should be able to do its job, that the dog, dog is the only one who can be responsible for the jumping. But I mean, it's not easy as that. Jumping is a complex thing, especially when with the angles and the outs and the S lines we have today. It's such a complex thing. And I think we should be really, really humble with, um, with the complexity of it and that it is really, really hard. So, yeah. Yeah, it Keeping is. Dog strong enough. Mm. And I think it's a really important subject. You should talk more and focus more about it in training because a lot of people say like, yeah, it's just a jump. So the dog should jump or he, he can jump 60 centimeters. Yeah, well, maybe do it by yourself and do it in this speed and in <laughs> this ankles. And then we will see if it's just like 60 centimeters should be nothing for us. Yes. Yeah? So it's, yeah. I absolutely agree. So, but let's talk about another topic a little bit. Tell us more about agility in Sweden. Agility in Sweden, yeah. Um, we, um, I think agility in Sweden isn't that different from agility in Germany or maybe the rest of Europe. We have had five sizes for some years now. So that was, uh, of course, a big change. And uh, in the beginning, I think we had quite a f it wasn't as many in the intermediate height as in the what what we call extra large is the international large but uh, those last years it has really become a big change so i would say that the intermediate height is um, as big as the international large and of course that has opened up for a lot of dogs and also we have, when we have the extra small height so it has opened up for those really really small dogs um, I'm thinking back when I was running with my Jack Russell Terrier and she was 27 uh, centimeter and she was jumping sometimes 35 by that time because when we had uh, that, that height. And so I think that's really, really cool for the smaller dogs. Yeah, um, yeah and um, I think um, people are very, uh, what do you say? People have high goals and they have a lot of great teams. And I think uh, the sport is developing a lot. And like the qualifications are like similar to Germany? No, not at all. We only have one weekend and where everything, is, where we, everything counts. So we have a weekend in May where we run eight runs. And uh, that's the tryout for both European Open, AWC, and also we have um, the Nordic Championships. That's wow. here so in the Nordic, Nordic countries. Yeah, that weekend, that specific weekend means a lot. So you need yeah. to be really fit that weekend. Yeah. And if you like messed up there, you are out. You have yeah, no possibility exactly. to. Oh, wow. Yeah. And how is it it's for hard. the dogs? Like eight runs? Yeah, of course. I mean, of course, it's a heavy weekend. And no doubt about it. That's uh, no doubt about that, but um, yeah, that's that's the way it is. So we just have to, you know, like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
And about... I mean, Sweden, is a, Sweden is a small country, so it's, I think it would be very hard to have. Uh, of course, I would love to have more weekends, but I think Sweden is a small country and uh, it could be hard to find organizers for uh, such a big event. So it's, we, I think this is like everything that's possible right now. And so it's been, yeah, working out until now at least. So we'll see what will happen in the future. And how are the training possibilities there? Because you're told now it's like ice everywhere. Are there a lot of training halls? Or because outside it's maybe not for <laughs> so long time possible. Yeah, we have had a long winter this year. I really feel like that. Um, <laughs> but we have we have quite a lot of halls now in, in Sweden. So, of course, that has made a huge impact on the agility here in Sweden. I must say, I mean... When I was doing agility when I was a teenager, then, I mean, you were do, basically doing it in the summertime. But, and now we have holes from southern Sweden to northern Sweden. So, of course, it's an enormous big difference. Um, but, um, yeah, you know, I live on the countryside, so I have so far to go to the closest hole anyway. So I really, I really wish that the spring will come really, really soon so I can have... A, I have my field here and have, you know, have my students here at home. So really looking forward to that. You also told before that you quite often drive to Germany. So is there a special reason for it or? Yeah, but as I said, I, I love to just run on the, in those big rings and uh, when it's like, Uh, cool judges and also to get inspiration I think you have so many incredibly cool and talented handlers and teams in Germany and it's just such an inspiration to just be around and watch all the cool runs and for me it's that it's all such a big part of it I mean watching cool agility I mean I mean, that's, uh, I mean, that's wow. And just standing and waiting for your turn and see the coolest team bef before you. So, yeah, that, and that's awesome. So, I mean, it's a trigger. You want to, you want to perform even better yourself. So, uh, yeah. And also, we also really like it in Germany. I think you both have um, such, a, such so many high performance and professional teams, but at the same time, you have, have a very, very relaxed attitude outside um, the competition so yeah i think it's very fun and um yeah and do you combine really it do you combine it with some training or you go there only for competitions yeah i try to um combine it with trainings when i have the possibility and i always say that i'm, I'm a private product of great trainers so um, <laughs> yeah and that's um it's a privilege when I can combine it. But from time to time, you develop your own style of training, would you say? Um, yes, of course. I mean, you, you, you pick and pick a little from here and there. And I mean, when I started Agility, I, I was such a beginner and you, ha you have to, you know, learn everything. And I must say that I'm so grateful for the great trainers I've had the opportunity to train for during my, my career. And in the beginning, I really learned a lot from Finnish trainers. I, I must say that, I mean, you are in Finland and Jana Kalwander, they, I mean, how much they have meant for me. And, um, I think it's really important that we always try to, you know, get new inspiration, learn from new trainers. And um, you can learn so much from every new trainer you, you meet. So never stop developing yourself. That's the best part of dog training, that you always have so much to, to learn. True, but was it hard for you to pick out the right things for you and your dog well but you also learn to find those trainers that you really that really fits you um and um that fits fits your style and fits you as a person so yeah 
and you, and you you stick to those who really can develop you and uh, yeah. it's amazing when they when they get to know you and they know your dog and then they know exactly what kind of feedback you need and of course i try to you know have that feeling also when it comes to my own students since i work as a agility trainer um i just love when i can explain and show something easy enough so people really really learn and uh, I, nothing also beats washing team running something that they didn't believe that, that they could do that's also the coolest thing with being a teacher and it also comes back so it's same as dog training it's about creating exercises that are hard enough to challenge but also that you get a lot of reward from it that people's success in a in a in, in, in a good rate so is this the reason what fascinates you so much to train dogs or to also do some agility training ah uh, yes of course and um I mean, what's, what's so fascinating with dog training is that uh, every new dog you have also makes you think that you know nothing about dog training. <laughs> I mean, uh, how do I explain it? Um, I mean, every new dog you have, I mean, you, um, I mean, you change sometimes everything for every new dog, but you also change nothing. And with that, I mean that you need to see what dog you have in front of you and you need to change and adapt everything but in the end it comes back to dog training that you know change we are creating behaviors and we are creating the right emotions so um yeah and i guess it's the same also with the teaching agility <laughs> yeah nice setting so but by checking the clock wow the time yes. is really running fast we have always in the end the short questions and the short answers and we have something special because you agree that we do it once in german and once in english oh my god oh my god i don't know why i <laughs> agree to this but <laughs> at least it will be very fun for my german friends so they have something to laugh <laughs> <laughs> so let's do it are you ready yeah los geht's agility is for me ein großer Teil meines Lebens. Lieblingsgerät im Agility. Ich glaube, Slalom. Meine Hunde sind für mich. Meine besten Freunde und meine Familie. Der wichtigste Satz, den ich je im Training gehört habe. Es ist nur Agility. <lacht> Agility in Schweden wird sich in den nächsten fünf Jahren hoffentlich weiterentwickeln. Was ich gerne jedem Agi Sportler sagen möchte. Lauf jedes Turnier, als wäre es ihr letztes. Well done, oh my God. <laughs> Very good. And once in English. Agility yes. is for me. A huge part of my life. Favorite obstacle in agility? It's the wheels, I think. My dogs are for me. They are my best friends and they're my family too. The most important sentence I have ever heard in training. It's just agility. Agility in Sweden will increase in the next five years. Just ho hopefully just continue to develop. What I would like to say to the agility community. Run every, every run like if it's your last. <laughs> Thanks for the deep insights into your world and your view of agility. Thank you very much. Thank you. So have a nice evening. 
You too. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Bye-bye. 